The Lazy Way to Enlightenment Banke's Unborn Zen The unborn is not something difficult to attain. It is not something distant. It is not something we have to search for. It is not something we have to discover. It is something we already have, right here, right now. Banke Yotaku Zen Buddhism is a major school of Mahayana Buddhism that originated in China and later spread to Japan. The term Zen comes from the Sanskrit word Dhyana, which refers to a state of deep meditation and awareness. Zen emphasizes the experience of direct, intuitive realization of the nature of reality and the attainment of spiritual enlightenment. There are two names considered most important to the development of Zen, and they are Dojin and Hakuin. Dojin Kigen was the founder of Soto Zen. The question that Dojin became obsessed with as a young man and which motivated his search for truth was, if the Buddha says that we are already enlightened, why must we do spiritual practice? Simply put, the answer that Dojin came to was that practice itself was an expression of enlightenment. Because of this conclusion, one of the main practices of Soto Zen became Shikantaza. Shikantaza means just sitting. In Shikantaza, one merely sits. There is no practice of concentration, nor of breath counting, etc. One merely sits. As Dojin said, you cannot get it wrong. Soto Zen is known as a gradual enlightenment school, meaning that one over time eventually realizes their inherent Buddha nature. Hakuin Ekaku was the founder of the Rinzai school of Zen Buddhism. Rinzai Zen is known as a sudden enlightenment school. This means that one's Buddha nature, or enlightened mind, is realized suddenly, often as the result of the climax of some crisis. Therefore, in this school of Zen, there is an emphasis on cone practice, a paradoxical and often irrational question designed to drive the practitioner beyond their ordinary mind. Other means in this school often involve striking, swearing, shouting at the student and forms of what is called crazy wisdom. Crazy wisdom often involves the Zen master performing unconventional and often outrageous behavior. This behavior can often break conventional moral and ethical norms and deeply challenge the assumptions and limitations of the student. All of this is done, however, to help the student break through the dualistic thinking that separates the self from the rest of the world and to achieve a deeper understanding of reality and ultimately to realize their inherent Buddha nature. Hakuin was known for his radical methods, which often included using vulgar language, physically abusing his students and even threatening them with violence. There is a third name that is just as important to Zen Buddhism as Dojin and Hakuin. That is Banke Yotaku. Banke was a contemporary of Hakuin. However, Hakuin strongly condemned Banke and his style of Zen practice. Hakuin called Banke Zen practice do nothing Zen. Banke founded no schools of Zen, and unlike Dojin and Hakuin, Banke appointed no successors. There are some, however, who consider Banke one of the most important Zen masters who has ever lived. One of those people is D.T. Suzuki. D.T. Suzuki was a Japanese Zen scholar and writer. He is credited with introducing Zen Buddhism to America and the Western world. Suzuki has a very high regard for Banke's teachings. He saw Banke as a Zen master who represented the true spirit of Zen and praised his approach to teaching, which he characterized as simple, direct, and free of religious formalities and rituals. In his book, Manual of Zen Buddhism, Suzuki wrote that Banke's teachings were direct, simple, and easy to understand, and that his message was accessible to people of all backgrounds and education levels. So, what did Banke teach? It wasn't just what Banke taught, but also the way in which he taught it. Banke utterly rejected the Zen Buddhist rituals and the priesthood of his time. Instead, he focused on the direct experience of enlightenment and believed that the usual Zen formalities were a distraction from the true essence of Zen. Banke did not view himself as a priest or master. 
but rather as a fellow seeker on the path to enlightenment. Therefore, he would speak and deliver his teachings to any group of people, no matter how socially high or low. His approach to Zen teachings democratized and made Zen accessible to people from all walks of life, regardless of their background or social status. Banke's teaching was centered around one concept only, the unborn. The unborn, sometimes also referred to as the unborn Buddha, the unborn mind, or unborn Zen, is the innate and unchanging nature of reality that lies within each person. Banke believed that the unborn was not something that needed to be attained through practice or effort, but was already present within each person. In his sermons, Banke emphasized the idea that the unborn was the true self of each person and that it was the source of all wisdom and compassion. He taught that the unborn was not separate from the world, but was in fact the very essence of the world itself. He encouraged his students, or anyone that he addressed, to look within themselves, to realize the unborn and to awaken to the truth of their own nature. Banke's teachings on the unborn were a radical departure from the traditional Zen teachings of his time, which often focused on meditation and ascetic practices. Banke rejected these formal trappings of Zen and instead focused on the direct, intuitive experience of enlightenment, which he believed was the true essence of Zen practice. Banke often used simple and straightforward language to explain the concepts of the unborn. He encouraged his students to put aside their doubts and misconceptions and to simply experience the truth of their own nature. He would often use humorous anecdotes and clever paradoxes to challenge his students' dualistic thinking and to help them see the truth for themselves. Banke's sermons were often lively and interactive, and he encouraged his students to ask questions and to engage in discussion. He was known for his ability to help his students awaken to the truth of their own nature through his teachings and example. So, what on earth did Banke mean by the unborn? And why was this concept so important to our awakening to our enlightened or Buddha mind? To understand what is meant by the unborn, one must first understand what is meant by the born. The born is any separate form, material forms such as your body, or immaterial forms such as thoughts, feelings, events, etc. These forms we think of as separate because each form is relative to another form. For example, we say, I am a son, therefore I must have parents. All of these relative forms are the born. The unborn is that reality that is always already prior to any form whatsoever. The unborn is not two. The unborn is not relative. Therefore, the unborn has no division no separation, no parts. The unborn is complete, whole, singular, as there's nothing for it to be in relationship to. The forms of the born, however, all have something in common. They have a beginning and an end. The forms of the born have a beginning and an end, regardless of whether they are material or immaterial forms. The born forms are, therefore, limited by time and space. The born forms are, therefore, impermanent and transitory. In every mystical tradition, east or west, they speak of the infinite and eternal, or that which has no beginning or end. Hence, if there is to be an infinite and eternal, that which has no beginning or end, then it cannot be limited to a form of any type. The infinite would have no boundaries, perimeters or borders, and it would not be relative to time or space. Time is a measure. Time begins here, ends here. Space begins here, ends here. So, the infinite and eternal could not have any relationship to time or space. The unborn is formlessness, the present reality prior to form. This unborn formlessness is without beginning or end. By virtue of its formlessness, it is beyond or prior to time and space. It must therefore be ever-present everywhere at all times at every time and at every place. The unborn surrounds all forms as it is without any boundaries, borders, perimeters, restraints or restrictions. The unborn penetrates and saturates all forms. 
The unborn is both interior and exterior to all that exists. Just as a building is both surrounded by gravity and inside, there is also gravity in every room. In the same way, all finite forms must exist within the infinite, while at the same time, the infinite exists within all finite forms. Form is the unborn. The unborn is form. The unborn is always present. For something to be real, it must be present at all times and under all circumstances. The unborn is the real. The born forms, by comparison, appear and disappear. The born is unreal. Each night we enter a deep, dreamless sleep. In that condition, there are absolutely no forms. There's no self, no mind, no thoughts, no relationships, no others, no world, no universe. There is simply an empty, formless presence. There is simply the unborn. Suddenly, superimposed on this unborn reality is the dreaming condition when the forms of mind become present, followed by the waking condition when we seem to exist as forms among other forms. But if you ask what is your existence in its simplest, most basic condition, it would be this condition when you are alive and yet empty, when you are simply the unborn. The condition is similar to deep, dreamless sleep when there is no you, the empty formlessness that is prior to the condition that we call our life. In other words, our life is a form. It has a beginning and it has an end. The unborn is prior to our life. It runs through our life. It is after our life. The unborn is the real and lasting condition. In the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha says, no beginning is the highest truth. The unborn is the highest truth. In the Hindu tradition of Advaita, they speak of Ajata as the highest teaching and truth. Ajata means no creation. The sixth patriarch of Zen, Hui Ning, said in his poem, If there is nothing from the start, where can the dust alight? Indeed, if there is nothing from the start, where can the dust, i.e. problems, land? If we recognize the unborn as the reality of this moment, where or how can problems arise for us? In the Heart Sutra it says, All phenomena are emptiness. They are not born. In emptiness there is no consciousness, no body, and no mind. There is no form, no origin. We see all the forms as existing, but all existence is temporary. It has the quality of a dream or an illusion. The Dalai Lama spoke of the practicality of understanding the unborn. He said, to understand the unborn greatly affects how we live our lives. The unborn pervades not only our own individual ego or sense of self, but the whole of reality, that emptiness is its ultimate nature or mode of being. To realize, that is to see through the deception of ignorance. Freedom from ignorance is called nirvana. Realizing the unborn is directly related to our quest to purify our mind of afflictive emotions like hatred, anger and desire. We project on the things a status of existence and a mode of being which is simply not there. This understanding of the unborn is one of the principal factors of the true path for such an insight cuts right through the illusion created by the misapprehension of grasping things and events as existing. We realize the emptiness of all phenomena, not just the mind and body of the individual. This is what Banke taught, and he taught it to anyone who came to him regardless of rank or status. He rejected all the rituals of Zen and taught in a simple and straightforward way. Banke, during his spiritual search, had spent years and years of the most grueling meditation and renunciate practice. Afterwards, he said that this had been a complete waste of time. He taught that all that was needed was not years of painful and unnecessary practice, twisting body and mind into knots, but merely the simple insight and complete acceptance of the truth of the unborn reality that permeates everything. The unborn is closer than your own breath. Banke's teaching was ultimately a very practical one, as it taught the emptiness of all form and that therefore nothing really matters. Or to put it another way, 
nothing is mattering. Realizing that ultimately nothing matters allows us to deeply consider how much anguish we should invest in any temporal, impermanent and relative fixation. An awareness of the unborn is to consciously witness life as if watching the unfolding of a dream, looking and seeing only impermanence arising and falling in emptiness, while also recognizing that the one who is aware is also the unborn. Awareness is also empty. Awareness is also unborn. Thus, the world and the universe cease to be in any meaningful sense. This realization unconsciously dictates every action. Therefore, morality is natural. Every moment holds the amusing importance of potentially being one's last. One, in a sense, has died before they have died, because moment to moment one's absence or unbornness is as much in conscious awareness as one's momentary presence. This radical insight can profoundly release us from all seriousness and return us to a humorous life of play. This is what Banke taught. Chapita